All right, we're in Psalm 55. We're going to look at Psalms 55, 56, and 57. Let's begin reading together here in the psalm, Psalm 55. I'll read beginning at verse 1 and read through the psalm. Then we'll get into our study tonight. Psalm 55, beginning at verse 1 and reading through the psalm. David the psalmist writes, Give ear to my prayer, O God, and do not hide yourself from my supplication. Attend to me and hear me. I am restless in my complaint and moan noisily because of the voice of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they bring down trouble upon me, and in wrath they hate me. My heart is severely pained within me, and the terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling have come upon me, and horror has overwhelmed me. And I said, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then I would fly away and be at rest. Indeed, I would wander far off and remain in the wilderness, Selah. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. Destroy, O Lord, and divide their tongues, for I have seen violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around it on its walls. Iniquity and trouble are also in the midst of it. Destruction is in its midst. Deceit and guile do not depart from its streets. For it is not an enemy who reproaches me. Then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me, who has magnified himself against me. Then I could hide from him. But it was you, a man my equal, my companion, and my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together, walked to the house of God in the throng. Let death seize them. Let them go down alive into hell. For wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon. I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. He has redeemed my soul in peace from the battle which was against me, for there were many against me. God will hear and afflict them, even he who abides from old, Selah, because they do not change, therefore they do not fear God. He has put forth his hands against uh, those who were at peace with him. He has broken his covenant. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter. But war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. But you, O God, shall bring them down to the pit of destruction. Bloodthirsty and deceitful men shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in you. Another cheery little psalm to start off the evening with. As we look at this particular psalm here, David is recording an experience of persecution as well as betrayal by a very, very close friend. Commentators do not know exactly the event that he is writing about, but what is known about this psalm is that uh, David is severely wounded by the treachery. Now, as we examine this psalm, I want you to notice that it begins with despair, but it concludes with hope. David is sorrowing over the hate people have for him. He's also in great pain over the treachery of a dear friend, and and yet even though he's going through such personal sorrow, throughout this psalm you see that, that David knows that God is with him. Now, as he goes through this pain... And notice how he says, for example, in uh, verse 2, Attend to me, hear me, I am restless in my complaint and moan noisily. As it goes through these emotions, we need to remember that these kinds of things are common to every believer. That's because trials and afflictions accompany us. That's just the way it is. It's part of our journey of faith. The Bible tells us in Psalm 34, 19, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. It's just part of being a believer. There are going to be times that people don't like you. In the New Testament, Jesus Christ tells us even your own family can hate you. Your closest friends can turn away from you. And so David's complaint doesn't mean that he has a lack of faith. As a matter of fact, it shows his faith in that he takes his complaint to the Lord. And he cries out to God, and he's asking the Lord to minister to him and to relieve him of the pain that he's going through. Now, notice in verses 1 and 2 how he begins by simply saying, Give ear to my prayer, O God. Do not hide yourself from my supplication. I have an anxious complaint that I'm bringing before you, and I'm asking you to listen to my prayer. When he speaks concerning this complaint that he has, that word complaint is a word that means anxiety or trouble. 
It speaks about the things that he's meditating on and musing about, and it's caused his heart to be concerned. There's an inner turmoil that he's experiencing. And instead of just, you know, living with it and trying to tough it out himself, he takes this complaint to the Lord. He takes his concern to the Lord. The concern that he has is causing tremendous turmoil. The Proverbs in Proverbs 12, 25 tells us, anxiety in the heart of a man causes depression. And that's what he's going through. He's going through a time of an anxiety. Somebody has betrayed him. There are many people who are opposing him. He says in verse 3, because of the voice of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, they bring down trouble upon me. In wrath, they hate me. So this is what has made him anxious to pray to the Lord. Their voices are loud. They're louder than anything else he can hear. He's becoming overwhelmed by what is going on, and he's beginning to cry out to the Lord. That's something that we may go through ourselves. We can sometimes have things going on in our life that are so overwhelming that the only thing that we can hear is the sound of the problem. The only thing that we can see is the problem surrounding us. We can take our eyes off the Lord, and when we do so, the only thing we're going to see is the conflict that is, is our life, is the conflict and anxiety that sometimes we indeed will go through. It reminds me of the Apostle Peter, how, how that he's there in the boat with the other apostles, and Jesus is walking on water, and you remember the story well, how that Jesus is walking past them, and they see him, and and call out to him, and the apostle Peter says, uh, Lord, if it is you, command me that I should climb out of this boat and, and come to you, and I will. And, and Jesus says, well, come. And, and we know the story. We know how he, he slips out and he begins to walk on water there towards the Lord. And as he does so, he's walking in faith, doing something that's impossible. But as long as his eyes are, are remaining steadfast on Jesus Christ, well, all things are possible with God. Jesus is walking on water. He makes it possible for the Apostle Peter to do the same. And yet, as he's walking towards the Lord, we realize, of course, that he begins to hear the sound of the wind. He sees the boisterous waves and all, and, and becomes aware of his circumstances and situations. He becomes aware of the fact that it's impossible to walk on water. And as he does so, immediately his faith fails. He sinks. He begins to go under the water, and the Lord Jesus Christ reaches down after Peter cries out and says, Lord, save me. And he pulls him out. And he walks them back to the boat. A lot of people are like the apostles who, who stayed in the boat. We have a tendency of criticizing somebody who's trying to do the impossible. But for me, the apostle Peter is a great example of somebody who, who stepped out. Even though the Lord says you have little faith, he had a lot more faith than the other guys who stayed in the boat and basically were the, the naysayers, the ones who, who are, you know, the, the, the armchair quarterbacks. You know, there's always an armchair quarterback there saying, oh, you shouldn't have done it that way, and the church should be run this way, and this is how things ought to be done. As they pick their teeth with the Bible bookmarker, they never do anything other than complain. But the Apostle Peter is going out there doing something, and his anxiety is demonstrated, and the lack of faith occurs. Well, that happens in people who are following the Lord. Sometimes you find yourself in a situation that is impossible. There's no way that we're going to be able to do this. And yet the Lord says, just trust me and follow me. And there may be anxiety in your heart. And David has that here. David has a sense of anxiety, has a sense of sorrow. There's oppression that's taking place. The voice of the enemy, enemy is the only thing he can hear. They hate me, he says in verse 3. In verse 4, my heart is severely pained within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling have come upon me. Horror has overwhelmed me. I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then I would fly away and be at rest. Indeed, I would wander far off and remain in the wilderness. Salah means think about that. Meditate on this. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. The fear of his enemies is so severe that he has chest pains. He's weak and he's helpless. His greatest impulse is to simply flee, to escape from this terrible situation. And yet he goes on in verse 9 to say, Destroy, O Lord, divide their tongues, for I have seen violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around it, on its walls. Iniquity and trouble are also in the midst of it. Destruction is in its midst. Deceit and, and guile do not depart from its streets. He's crying out for justice here. All around me I see violence, I see strife, I see iniquity, I see trouble. I look around and I can't see anything that's good. I find no righteousness in this place. There's nothing but deceit and hypocrisy. 
When he says here in verse 9, divide their tongues, that's another way of saying, may their plans fail. Lord, confuse their speech so even as they're making plots to destroy me, it isn't going to happen. The Bible tells us in Psalm 33, 10, the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. So he's saying, Lord, even though they're plotting harm against me, confound them and confuse them. Now, in verse 12, by the way, in Psalm 55, verses 12 through 14, those, those verses are very, very personal to me. These are personal verses the Lord uh, showed me as I was reading through the Scriptures on one occasion. And it's something that I can share a little bit about with you right now when he says this. He, he basically is identifying who has caused him such pain. He's identifying who has broken his heart. He says, it's not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me who has magnified himself against me, then I could hide from him. But notice what he says, it was you. A man, my equal, my companion, and my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together, walked in the house of God in the throng. It wasn't an enemy. It wasn't somebody who, 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 who I knew was an enemy. It was, it was a dear, dear friend. I have been betrayed, he's saying, by somebody I enjoyed sweet fellowship with. I have been betrayed by a dear friend. I have had my heart broken by somebody who said he loves me. And that's what hurts the most. I have been broken, he's saying, by somebody that I used to go to church with. We can bring that to New Testament terms used to go and worship the Lord in the house of God with. For us in the New Testament, it's like saying, I have a Christian brother who stabbed me in the back. I have a Christian brother that I used to sit after church and drink coffee and share my heart with, that I would share my plans, my life, my desires, my closest friend. We would take counsel together. He'd give me advice. And we talk about the things of the Lord. We went to church together. We hung around together. It's my dear friend who's broken my heart. Well, that makes sense to me. It makes sense to all of us, of, of course. I mean, you know, how many of us can say an enemy broke my heart? If we say an enemy broke our heart, then we we're foolish to make that person a confidant in the first place. Now, the ones who break your heart and the ones who break it the worst are, of course, the closest friends that you have. The more you love somebody, the more leverage they have in your life, the more power they have over you, then, then the greater the wound. And that's what he's speaking about here. He's speaking about the fact that this is somebody who's torn him up, somebody that he has loved with all of his heart. I've been betrayed by a, a dear friend. In Psalm 41, uh, verse 9, the psalmist said, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate, bread has, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. It was a close friend that I had fellowship with. Now, of course, every one of us who's a believer in this room, every human being really can, can say the same kind of thing, but it hurts especially when it's somebody that you had fellowship with as a believer. Every one of us can say that we have had close friends who have betrayed us, who have spoken ill of us, who have attempted to hurt us in one way or another. I've had friends over the years who've done things like that without getting mundane, without going into any melodramatic stories. I can tell you that the deepest wounds that I as a Christian have ever experienced are wounds that I've received not from the world. I expect the people who don't know the Lord to, to reject and, and, and all of that. I expect that. The deepest wounds that any person that, you know, for me, and I'd say for any person, is the wounds that come from a spiritual friend, from a brother or sister in the Lord who, uh, who took your confidences and used it against you. And that's what he's speaking about here. He's saying, this is, this is the deepest wound that I've ever received. It's, it's, it's from a friend. It's from somebody who loved me. It's somebody that I opened my heart to. It's somebody that I fellowshiped with. It's somebody I prayed with. I went to church with, read the Bible, and shared verses with. It's somebody that, that, that I would never in a hundred years, a thousand years, ever would have thought that they would turn their back on me and do this kind of thing. It was you, my friend, my equal. It was you, the one that I love so very much, and that broke my heart. You think of the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, how he selected 12 men. And you think of how that the Lord Jesus Christ poured himself into these 12 men only to have one who is Judas. In Matthew chapter 26, the Bible tells us in verses 21 through 25, 
As they were eating, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. They were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? And he said to him, You have said it. He who ate my bread has lifted up his heel against me. It's one thing when you have an enemy who plots your destruction. It's one thing to have somebody who hates you, who's trying to destroy you. It's another thing when you have a close friend who does that. And that's who David is speaking about. It was a companion, somebody that he had counseled with, somebody that he went and worshipped God together with, and it has broken his heart. Now, in verse 15, it's not a very nice thing to say here. Let death seize them. Let them go down alive into hell, for wickedness is their dwellings and among them, is in their dwellings and among them. And I realize, of course, none of you have ever thought in your heart, I'd like them to go to hell. I know none of you have ever thought that. Liars. <laughs> you have been hurt and you've thought, you know what, I don't care. And that's basically what he is saying. Uh, in the Old Testament, you will find, uh, especially here in the Psalms, you will see uh, many times uh, what are called imprecatory psalms, where they're basically calling down God's judgment on somebody. And that's what he's doing here. And he's basically saying, for what they have done, they deserve God's judgment. He's calling out for justice here. In verse 16, though, he goes on and says, as for me, I will call upon God. and The Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. By the way, out of verse 17 and, and other places, but here in verse 17, I want you to note that the Jews had a habit of praying three times a day. Not that that was prescribed by God, but that was a habit that they had, and, and, and David is referring to the fact that he does pray. Now, it was used in a literal sense, and that's why they would pray three times a day. What David is in, intending to communicate is, I cry, I cry out to the Lord constantly. I cry out in the morning, I cry out later on, I cry, cry out in the evening. He's not saying that this is when you should pray, you know, three times a day, but he's simply saying, uh, without ceasing, I am praying, and that's the point that he's making here. I'm crying out to God, why? Because God will save me. He shall hear my voice, he says. Verse 18, he's redeemed my soul in peace from the battle which was against me. There were many against me. God will hear and afflict them, even he who abides from old. Selah, because they do not change, therefore they do not fear God. So David knows that God will answer his continual prayer for help, and God will judge those men who have harmed him. I want you to notice something here. It's something you might pass up in verse 19. It's very powerful, and I marked it in my own Bible so that I might be able to refer to it and remember this. Because they do not change, therefore they do not fear God. People can say that they have a relationship with God. They can cry out and say, I'm a religious person. They can say to you, I go to church. They can say to you, I, I sing in the choir. They can say to you, you know, I, I give gifts to God. I give offerings. He says, because they do not change, they do not fear God. If you have a relationship with God... Your life is going to change. It's so basic, of course. You hear me say this all the time. But I have, I've encountered so many people over the years who will say, I've got a relationship with God who never changed. There's nothing different about them. If you put them in, in, in the world next to somebody who would never say he has a relationship with God, you couldn't tell the difference between the two lives. There's nothing different about the person saying, I have a relationship with God. You see, when you have a fear of the Lord, when you understand eternity and recognize the fact that ultimately you stand before God and you give an account of your life to Him, Jesus said, every idle word that a man shall speak, he gives account thereof in the day of judgment. When you stand before the Lord... And give an account of yourself to God. Paul said, everyone shall give account of himself to God. When you stand before the Lord 
and give an account of yourself to the Lord, there needs to be the reality of repentance and a changed life. And if you claim, a person claims to have a relationship with God, and yet their life is indistinguishable from somebody who would never even make that claim, well, the psalmist here is saying they don't fear God. And because they don't fear God, there's no changes in their life. But when you have a healthy fear of God, a reverence of God, a respect of God, an awareness of His awesome power and might and His righteous judgment, when you understand that He poured His wrath out on His Son, Jesus Christ, when Jesus died on that cross, and when Jesus took upon Himself the full weight and the full penalty, the full weight of my sin and the penalty due my sin, and when you understand that what he suffered, he suffered for you. And you see that God did not spare his own son, but delivered him up. Because sin was that evil. You know, Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, is the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. And the death of Jesus Christ on the cross is to illustrate in the most graphic way possible for us God's hatred for sin. But many people have a tendency of using the word grace to cover their lack of repentance over a pet sin. Now, some sins I can repent from easily because they never were besetting. There never were things that I really, really had a problem with. So, so I can repent from various sins that have never been a problem to me very easily. But the one that besets me, sometimes I can make an excuse for that. I can say, well, you know, that's just the way I was raised. You know, and that's, that's just my nature. I mean, I'm passionate, you know, and I can get angry. I'm a Hispanic. That's the way it is. We can do that, can't we? We can do that. We can do that. I have heard people. You have heard people. Perhaps you've even done it yourself. Oh, that's just part of my culture. That's just the way that we are. That's just the way we've been raised. That's how it is with us. And you have to accept that. No, I don't. And neither does God. And I should never accept that in me. What I should do is I should fear the Lord and depart from evil. Because that's wisdom, you see. That's where wisdom comes in, guys, is to recognize that, that you might be enjoying yourself right now, but that, that, that old saying is true. You know, if you want to dance, you are going to pay the piper. You ultimately reap what you are sowing, and that's just the reality of life. I mean, that's just the way it is. The Bible makes it very clear that, that if you have a fear of the Lord, you do step away from evil. In Proverbs 16, verse 6, it says, In mercy and truth, Atonement is provided for iniquity. By the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. So he's saying that. He's saying they do not fear God. Therefore, they do not change. I encourage you, if you have a fear of the Lord, then change. Repent and follow his ways. Verse 20, he has put forth his hand against those who were at peace with him. He has broken his covenant. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter. But war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. The wicked attack even those with whom they have no quarrel. This one is a hypocrite. He knows how to win friends, but within his heart there is no loyalty towards them. Be very careful if you have somebody who is constantly flattering you. Be very careful if you're a uh, we'll say you're a, a, a lady and, and you're at work and uh, things may, may, not, may not be going well at home. You may be married. You could be single, whatever the case may be. You go to work and here comes the office, you know, Romeo, and he stands next to you and he says, oh, wow, you know, excuse me, I'm sorry. I didn't want, you know, I don't want to startle you, you know, but man, that perfume that you wear, I'm sorry. Boy, it's nice. What is it called? Oh, it's called Ooh La La. Really? <laughs> You're wearing Ooh La La today, huh? <laughs> yes. You know what? I'm sorry. You know, you just distracted me for a moment. But now that we're talking, you know, is that a new dress you're wearing? 
you know what, have you been on a diet? I mean, you look nice, you know. Watch out, that is such a con. It's not that you're not beautiful, of course you are in God's sight. <laughs> but flattery will kill you. There are so many who have given in to that. And the Bible says the man is like the ox going to the slaughter. There ought to be a perfume called that, ox to the slaughter perfume. <laughs> you know, because he goes all starry-eyed, you know, oh, off he goes and he ends up dead. And the bottom line is, be careful. Be careful. There are people who, uh, who want to win your approval and favor and will use it against you or will harm you. Be careful. I discovered something a long time ago. I'm not as bad as some people say, and I'm not as good as I think. I'm somewhere in the middle. And so when somebody says to me, you are the worst thing that I've ever met, I'll say, no, you haven't met Rawl. You know, I'm not that bad. <laughs> if they say you're good, you're the best thing since sliced bread, that's not true either. You know, I'm just in the middle somewhere, just like you. Flattery is destructive. And there are people who will use it in order to gain advantage. And that's what he's speaking about. The words in verse 21 of his mouth are smoother than butter, but war is in his heart. His words are softer than oil, but they're drawn swords. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 29, 5, a man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. He goes on in verse 22 and says, Cast your burdens on the Lord. He shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. But you, O God, shall bring them down to the pit of destruction. Bloodthirsty and deceitful men shall not live out half their days. But I will trust in you. In other words, turn your enemies over to God. Do not try to revenge yourself. Listen. If somebody is gossiping about you, and, and, and some in this room understand what I'm saying, perhaps some of you have never really encountered somebody who finds great pleasure in destroying you with their tongue. Perhaps I have somebody in this room who has never been the victim of gossip. You're such a wonderful person, they never say a thing about you, you are so good. And there are some like that. And bless God for them. That's a wonderful testimony and all. But you probably are like me. You may occasionally have somebody who would love to say something about you. Now, let me say this briefly. In ministry, it's absolutely true. The Lord blesses in one way and the enemy undermines in another. That's just the way it is. And sometimes people will see the pastor and say, oh, he's this or he's that. And I learned a long time ago, and I practice this because this happens like almost weekly, frankly. Frankly, truthfully, almost weekly. Probably weekly. Um, now that I think about it, it happens every day. No, um, <laughs> and that's just with Marie and the kids, you know. I'm... But it's true. It, it happens all the time. I mean, I'll be standing in the back. It happened just this week, and I'll be standing in the back, and somebody will walk up and say, I'm bitter with you. I've been mad at you. I mean, that's just the way it is. I mean, that happens all the time. If you're constantly trying to clear your name, you're making a mistake. You're making a mistake. If you take care of your character, God will take care of your reputation. Just do the right thing. If you're always trying to say, I didn't do that and I didn't say that and how come you're doing this? You will waste a lifetime trying to stamp out little fires that are simply distractions and don't even matter ultimately. You see, there's one who's going to judge you one day and that's God. And God will judge you. And if you have a fear of, of, of the Lord in your heart, you're going to live right for His sake. But I learned that a long time ago. You know, to come up every time I teach and say, oh, by the way, this is the latest What's the point? What's the point in defending yourself? You can defend yourself or you can allow God to defend you. Now, who would you rather have defend you? God never loses. And when you try to defend yourself, it looks like you're guilty. Oh, must have done it because look at him squirm. So just move on. Just keep on moving and let the Lord work. And God will take care of everything. And he always does. God takes care of everything. I never worry about it anymore. I used to, but not anymore. 
In verse 23, when he says, you, O God, shall bring them down to the pit of destruction, he's basically saying, I'm going through trouble, but I will trust steadfastly in you to the end. Every one of us goes through something. Every one of us goes through trials and tribulation. It's just part of being a Christian, but we can trust the Lord. In 2 Corinthians, in chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, Paul said it this way, We do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia. We were burdened beyond measure, above strength. We despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, does deliver us, and in whom we trust that He will still deliver us. God works past, present, and future. I will trust Him no matter what. And that's what David is saying here. I will trust in you. Now, Psalm 56, beginning at verse 1, continuing to uh, verse 13. This is another psalm of David. Be merciful to me, O God, for man would swallow me up, fighting all day he oppresses me. My enemies would hound me all day, for there are many who fight against me, O Most High. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I will praise His word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? All day they twist my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather together, they hide, they mark my steps when they lie in wait for my life. Shall they escape by iniquity? In anger cast down the peoples, O God. You number my wanderings, put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? When I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know, because God is for me. In God, I will praise His word. In the Lord, I will praise His word. In God, I have put my trust I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Vows made to you are binding upon me, O God. I will render praises to you, for you have delivered my soul from death. Have you not delivered my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? So this psalm, once again, is speaking of enemies of David. They're twisting his words against him, as he says in verse 5. And once again, though he's going through much pain, his trust remains steadfast in the Lord. Notice in verses 1 and 2 how he cries out for God's mercy. He cries out to the Lord and says, Be merciful to me, O God, for man would swallow me up. Fighting all day, he oppresses me. My enemies would hound me all day, for there are many who fight against me, O, o Most High. My enemies are attacking me constantly. They oppress me. They hound me. There are so many against me. They slander me and they attack me, and it's not stopping. But... Verse 3, whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I will praise His word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? I want you to notice this. David fears. Sometimes we may think that an individual who actually admits to fear must not have any faith, but David is pointing something out that's very important to us, guys. You need to see this, and I want you to see this. It's a very powerful thing. He says, whenever I am afraid, one, he's saying, I do have fear. I go through tough times, and I can shake in my boots. I am so afraid. So he's admitting that. Whenever I am afraid, what's the, what's, what's, what am I supposed to do? I will trust in you. I put my hope in your word. I will trust in you. Yes, I go through fear. Yes, I have tough times. You know, um, fear is part of being human. Fear can cause you to do many things, but one of the things that fear can drive you to is your needs, to cry out to the Lord for help. And sometimes the Lord allows fear in our lives so that we can do just that. You see, his fear actually drives him to cling to God. You just had, uh, you just blessed me and my grandson Josiah by singing to my, my precious little lamb. Everybody who knows me knows that I am absolutely head over heels in love with that baby. I adore him. I had him yesterday. He wasn't feeling well. He's teething. And so his mama uh, gave him to, to, to my wife, Marie. And I came home, and, and she opens the, I opened the garage door, and, 
And she hears me coming in, and she steps to the back door, and there's little Josiah, and, and he's he doesn't speak. Of course, he's a year old, but he reaches for me and points his finger at me, and he'll go, that, that. That's me. I'm that. <laughs> it's cool. I don't care what he calls me. And so, so he's not feeling well, and we're, we're playing with him and loving him and all, and he's in Grandma's arms, and she's sitting on the couch, and he, he actually pushes away from her and, and, and moves her arm so he can fall out of her arm onto the couch and he crawls then he crawls onto my lap and he puts his head on my chest and goes to sleep and I was just holding him for 40 minutes you know and you want to know something it was hot but you want to know something man just multiply that I am enjoying this so much I just love him he clings to me about two or three months ago Anna was walking into the house, and she was holding Josiah. He was about nine months or ten months old. And as she was walking into the house, she, she had, didn't have her keys, so she yelled, you know, for instead of pushing the doorbell, she yelled, I don't have my keys. And when she yelled that, it startled the baby, and he began to cry. And I hear his cry. I didn't hear her yelling, but I heard his cry. Isn't that interesting? And I was in the other room, and I came running out of the room, and I swing the, the front door open, and he's there crying, and he sees me, and his eyes are just dripping with, 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 with tears, and he sees Grandpa, and he reaches out and lunches out, and I take him, and I place him in my arms, and I put his head on my shoulder, and he grabs hold of me. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. I will cling to you. I will hold you. And I was holding him, and I turned to my son, Dave, and I said, you see how helpless this baby is? Do you see how helpless he is? I said, he has no reactions. If you throw something at him, he doesn't know how to catch. It'll hit him right in the face. He cannot protect himself. He needs someone to care for him. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. I will hold fast to your word. I will praise you and rejoice in you. David was a warrior king. He killed a man who was nine feet, nine inches tall. And yet he's saying, when I'm afraid, when I'm afraid, you weren't afraid of Goliath. You weren't afraid of a, a bear. You weren't afraid of a lion. You weren't afraid of, and you're saying, when I'm afraid, yeah, there are things in my life that cause me great concern, anxiety of the heart. But I've learned to trust you in your word. I've learned to put my arms on you and grab hold of you and hold you for dear life and not let go. That's what fear can do for us. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. When I am afraid, I will trust your word because God's word is truth. You will not lie to me. You will not let me down. You will be with me, and you will deliver me, and I will praise you for this. I will hold fast to you, and I will love you. That's why he says in verse 4, In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what can flesh do to me. All day they twist my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather together. They hide. They mark my steps. When they lie down and wait for my life, Shall they escape by iniquity and anger cast down the peoples, O God? I'm trusted in you. You're going to take care of me in every way, even though they're twisting my words. In other words, they, they take what I say and they use my words against me to make me look bad. They, they're, they're false witnesses. They're lying about me. This reminds me, of course, what happened in the, uh, the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 26, verses 60 and 61, uh, even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none, but at last two false witnesses came forward and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. That was a pure lie. Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will build it up. But John says he spoke of his body and was referring to his resurrection. But they would take his words and would twist them. So don't be surprised when somebody takes what you've said and tries to use it against you. 
Notice verse 8, you number my wanderings, put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? When I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know because God is for me. In God, I will praise His word. In the Lord, I will praise His word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? When verse 8, when he says, you number my wanderings, put my tears into your bottle. When you're roaming the house at night, now, I know some of you have not yet done this. Perhaps one day you will. You might want to catalog this and think about it someday. And yet, as I look out, I see some people who are my age. When you're wandering the house at night and you're crying because you're concerned or you're, you're brokenhearted because something has happened or you have fear for a loved one, perhaps a husband, a wife, a child, a parent. He said, and I want you to see this. It's very, very practical. You number my wanderings. You can wander around your, your home. I've done that. I have, I've wondered, it's, it's late. My kids are supposed to be home. They haven't shown up yet. And God, I'm concerned for them. And, and, I've, and I've been up and, and I've walked the house. I've, I've walked outside. I've, I've, I've stood outside looking down the street waiting to hear the sound of their car. Wandering around, thinking, God, are they okay? Is everything all right? Are they... And there have been times when, when something has happened, when I lost my papa, when, 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 when things were done that, that, that broke my heart, frankly, uh, that, that I would weep and I would wander the house. And I would say, God, I just don't know what I'm going to do. God, I don't know what I'm going to do. My heart is busted in a thousand pieces, Lord. Can you heal this? Can you, can, you, can you take these ashes and, and can you really? Your word says you can. Can you really make it beauty? Is that possible, Lord? Can you take a broken heart and piece it together again? Can you take, can you take lost trust and lost hope and restore it? And you can be up. The person that you're in love with says to you, you want to know something? It's all over, man. I've got somebody else. I'll see you around. And you had everything planned out. You thought for sure you were going to marry this person. And on the side, they'd had somebody else. You, you loved them. You were committed to them. And then you hear through a friend, hey, you know what? You, you ought to check this out because I saw this person with somebody else. I'm telling you because I'm your friend. You need to be aware of it. So you, you ask, or perhaps you just drive up to where you think they are, and then lo and behold, there's their car in front of somebody's house that they shouldn't be there. And your heart is broken into a thousand different pieces. And you go home, and you wander the house, and you weep, and you say, God, why? Or that person you've been married to 10 years, you've had two kids with, calls you up and says, I want to let you know I'm not coming back. I'm out. Uh, you know, heard the story of, of somebody who was, was invited out for lunch by somebody, and when they came home, all their stuff had been put in the front yard, kicked out of the house. You're out, you're gone. And you wander. And you begin to weep. And he's saying, you, you know where I wander and my tears? You put them in a bottle. Um, in olden days, it said that, that people would actually weep into wineskins. They'd let their, their tears drip into wineskins. They'd close it up. Then they'd go to the burial place of a loved one. And they would take this, these, this wine bottle filled with their tears and they would place it on the tomb. And it was a way of saying, I am mourning and grieving, and the tears have been collected and placed here as a testimony of the pain that I'm suffering for you. And so he's saying, put my tears in a bottle. You number my wanderings, and you've written it down in a book, and you understand what I'm going through. That's what he's saying in verse 8 here. Very powerful, very powerful. There's one thing, though, I need to say. God does not forget the pain that you've gone through. And the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 7, verse 17, 
The Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And so our God knows when you've cried out silently, when you've been in the bathroom, closed the door, and you've wept, and you don't want anybody to know it, and then after you've cried, you've taken that cold water and you put it on a towel and you dabbed your eyes and tried to cause the swelling to go down and taken the visine and tried to clear the red up so that it doesn't appear that you've been crying. Well, the bottom line is, is God has already numbered your wanderings. He has a remembrance of your pain and he will wipe your tears away. And that's a wonderful word that the Lord gives to us. How do we know that? Well, he says, I praise his word. Verse 12, vows made to you are binding upon me, O God. I will render praises to you, for you have delivered my soul from death. Have you not delivered my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? In anticipation of deliverance, David begins to praise God because he knows the victory is sure. The Bible in Romans 8.37 simply says, We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I know that you will deliver me. Even though I'm awaiting it, I am speaking as if it's already occurred. I am more than a conqueror in you. And now finally, Psalm 57. Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you. In the shadow of your wings, I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed by. I will cry out to God most high, to God who performs all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me. He reproaches the one who would swallow me up, Selah. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. My soul is among lions. I lie among the sons of men who are set on fire, whose teeth are spears and arrows, their tongue a sharp sword. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have dug a pit before me. Into the midst of it, they themselves have fallen. Selah. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. Awake, my glory. Awake, lute and harp. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations, for your mercy reaches unto the heavens and your truth unto the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. So he says in verses 1 through 3 that he has great confidence in God. When he speaks concerning being in the shadow of his wings here in verse, uh, verse 1, he's saying that I am beneath those wings of protection. I have confidence because you are my refuge and you secure me. And I am willing to hide beneath your wings that you might protect me. Interestingly enough, and I want you to think about this for a moment, when he says in verse 1, in the shadow of your wings I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed by, David was willing to hide under the wings of the Lord, but Israel during the time of Jesus was not. David was. David said, I will, I will hide underneath you. You will secure me the way that a, that, a, that a mother hen will care for the chicks. You will take care of me, and I'm willing to be under your refuge. But in Luke chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus, speaking to the city of Jerusalem, said this. He said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing so the question has to be asked even as we look at this psalm and are about to complete the psalm. Are you willing? Are you willing to find security under the wings of the Lord? Are you willing? Israel was not. When Israel's Messiah came, Jesus said, I'm like a mother hen. There's a hawk that is circling above us. And I will bring you underneath my wings and I will give my life up for you. I will protect you to the death if you get underneath my wings. And Israel, I cried out to you. Jerusalem, I cried out to you. And I said, I'm like a mother hen. I see you as a brood. I see you as little chicks. And you're running headlong trying to protect yourself when all you need to do is come underneath me, the shadow of my wings, and I will protect you. The question has to be asked, am I willing? Are you willing? As the Lord calls you and says, I want you to find me, in me, your shelter and your refuge. I want to be your protector and your strength. I will care for you. Are you willing? A lot of people say no, like Israel. I'm not willing. I'll take care of myself. I can do this on my own. Well, he says, 
in verse 2, I will cry out to God most high, to God who performs all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me. He reproaches the one who would swallow me up. Think about that. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. So I am willing to come under his protection because he will deliver me. My soul is among lions. I lie among the sons of men who are set on fire, whose teeth are spears and arrows, their tongue a sharp sword. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above the earth. They've prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They've dug a pit before me. Into the midst of it, they themselves have fallen. My enemies are dangerous. They prowl about like a lion. They want to devour me. They use their tongues as a weapon of war in order to wound me. And in doing so, in using their tongues, they're destroying, they're attempting to destroy me. But I'm trusting in you because it's going to boomerang. It's going to come back on them. Verse 7, my heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. Awake, my glory. Awake, lute and harp. I will awaken the dawn. There are times in faith, and I don't know how to say this properly because... I haven't rehearsed this particular thought with you, but it is a very real, it's very real. There are times when you're walking in faith that you have to set your face like flint and you have to say, though none go with me, yet I will follow. No, though none are going to follow after me, I know where God is calling me. I know what God has called me to do. I will trust Him to the very end. I am steadfast in the Lord. There needs to be that mentality. There needs to be that sense of strength in you that comes from God. I don't know how to say that. Because what we have here right now, for many people in our fellowship, just coming and walking in those doors in the back and, and sitting here amongst us and, and all, you know, this may seem to be natural to you, but it is not natural. What God has done just here amazes me. To see what the Lord has done in this fellowship. To remember where I came from. To remember what I was. And to see what God does now. It may be church as usual to some, but to me, I am amazed. But one of the things, and I will say this to you, and it may resonate with somebody's heart. I believe in a God the God of the Bible, who says, I will bless you. I will. He's, he has told us over and over again. I, and that's what David had already said. I will trust in your word. I will remain steadfast. And when the wind of opposition comes, well, God, I want to be used by you plant my feet solidly that I might remain steadfast so that I might see your glory. Like when the children of Israel, Israel were about to cross through the Red Sea and, and they had been delivered by God out of Egypt and they have approached the Red Sea but, but they can't get across it and behind them are the armies and chariots of Pharaoh. And they begin to fear. And, 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 and Moses, as he's there seeing the Red Sea there, he's saying, oh my, we've got a sea on one side. I've got two million people I'm trying to shepherd. And I've got an army with, with the, the latest technology to, to us, their tanks, their chariots. And, and Pharaoh's chariots are coming. And the only thing that's keeping them right now is is the pillar that is, is separating them from us. I don't know what to do. And you know the story. Moses begins to cry out to God. And you know what God says to him? He says, stop praying. Stop praying. Stop praying and stand. For you shall see the deliverance and glory of the Lord. You're going to see something. You stand and you watch what I'm going to do. And that's when God causes that, that wind to come upon the Red Sea and he, and he dries it up. And the children of Israel march across it like it's, it's dry ground. Now there are those who say, well, the Red Sea at that time was, was only a few inches deep. What's the miracle, you know? Well, you know, Pharaoh's army was drowned in two inches of water. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a miracle by itself. <laughs> I mean, if that's the case. When they assayed, when they tried to get in and come after them, their chariot wheels were stuck in the water, and God released the water to come back upon them, and their bodies floated up to the shore. 
but stand and see the salvation of your Lord. Stand. And there are things that the Lord tells us, you know, stand. Don't move. Don't compromise. Don't say, oh, I, I sh did I hurt you? I'm sorry. You know, I'll be honest with you. I try to, to give words of grace to people. But one of the scriptures God gave me a long time ago was, was something Paul said when he says, have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? I want to tell you the truth. This is the truth. And love enough to tell the truth. But see, if I'd have been afraid of my dad, if I was afraid that my dad was going to get mad at me and never talk to me again, then I'd have never preached the gospel to my dad, and my dad would have died without Jesus Christ. See, I wasn't afraid of my dad. I loved my dad, and I wanted dad to know Jesus. So I was willing to say, Dad, you're a good man. You're the best man I'll ever know. But you will be the best man in hell if you don't give your heart to Jesus Christ. Bow your head. You're going to receive Christ because, Daddy, I don't want to go to heaven without you. Steadfast. Hold firm and watch God move. Some of you need to hear that today because you're in the place where you're going to compromise. You're beginning to waffle. You're beginning to think it's really not worth it. It's not that big a deal. David says it is. God says it is. It is. Remain steadfast. You need to hold fast. And praise the Lord. I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples, verse 9. I will sing to you among the nations, for your mercy reaches unto the heavens, your truth to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. I will praise you for your mercy, for your love, for your faithfulness to me. Even as the psalmist says in Psalm 104, 33, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. And I've seen guys, you know, I mean, I, 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 they come rolling up next to me sometimes and they've got their, 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 their music playing so loud it's rattling my teeth. You know, and they've got all that vibration going in their head, you know, and they look like those little bobblehead dolls. I mean, the vibration's moving their heads around and, and they're so cool. They look so very cool. And man, and they're yelling and they're shouting out their music and all of that, you know. And they get into it. I mean, I've seen people with the, you know, playing air guitar and using the hairbrush as their microphone and they, you know, they are the best thing and you know, all of that. You know, you see them, you hear the music all the time and that's the music of the world. That's why I think that we believers, well, we need to learn to exalt the Lord. We, we, we need to learn to praise the Lord, to sing even as he says. Why? We sing because he's been merciful to us. We sing because he's been faithful to us. We, we sing because he has delivered us. We sing because he blesses us. We sing to him and praise him because he, because he loves us. I mean, we've got a lot to sing about. We've got a lot to sing about. So may we learn to sing and praise the Lord. And before you start saying, I don't have anything to, think, to sing and praise about, you know what? You ought to sit down and start thinking about the blessings that God has brought into your life. And don't try and qualify them, by the way. I was praying the other day, and I was, I was using a model prayer that speaks concerning of just coming to the Lord, entering into the gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. And I was using that as a model. And, and uh, as I was praising the Lord in my prayer, and I was beginning a, a series of several steps in prayer, uh, I, at that point, I started saying, Lord, I, I thank you, but I wish. And then the Lord said, listen, why don't you stop qualifying what you thank me for? Why don't you just thank me? You know, oh, God, I pray, I thank you for my kids, but, Lord, you know, I'd like them to. And the Lord said, you know what? Why don't you just stop that? Why don't you just stop when you said, I thank you for my kids? Why don't you just stop when you said, I thank you for my wife? Why don't you just stop when you said, I thank you for the church? Why don't you just stop and thank me? And after doing that for several minutes, just saying, Lord, I thank you for this, I thank you for that, my heart was changed into praise. Because God, you know what? You have abundantly blessed my life. You've been so good to me. I've got a lot to thank you for. Listen, folks, let's do that more often, shall we? Let's praise the Lord more often. He is good to us, isn't he? He's loving to us. He's faithful to us. Hang in there and learn to praise him.